Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our webinar. My name is Katie Walker, and I'm a geospatial analyst here at Chesapeake Conservancy. Uh, a few brief administrative things before we begin. I'd like to let you know that this webinar will be recorded and made available after it's completed on our webpage. As it is an informational webinar, we have muted all participants that are not presenting. We ask that you please keep yourself muted throughout the entire webinar. We are accepting questions, but ask that you send them through the Zoom chat box, along with your full name and represented organization, so that we can address them at the end of the presentation. We plan to keep the presentation to about 40 or 45 minutes, which will give us plenty of time for questions. That being said, let's begin the webinar. To provide a brief introduction to many who may not know us, the Chesapeake Conservancy is a nonprofit based in Annapolis, Maryland. Our focus is on restoring and conserving the watersheds and landscapes that make the region special for current and future generations. We seek to form connections between people and the natural places of the watershed and between the people working here to promote conservation and restoration. We do this through innovative and collaborative projects with a focus on precision conservation. Utilizing our Conservation Innovation Center, a team dedicated to data-driven problem solving, we support projects that are effective and cost-efficient. Using geospatial analysis, we promote on-the-ground projects that will best reduce pollution by finding the right scale and right location for each project. In 2010, the EPA created a Chesapeake Bay TMDL, a total maximum daily load. Essentially, this is a breakdown of how much pollution needs to be addressed in order to promote a healthy watershed by 2025. The TMDL is broken down into measurable goals for each jurisdiction through watershed implementation plans, also known as WIPs. These WIPs created by each jurisdiction lay out best management practices, or BMPs, which are a suite of restoration projects that they intend to implement to reach their goals. In 2018, the Conservancy entered into a six-year cooperative agreement with EPA to provide geospatial support for the Chesapeake Bay Program, also known as CBP the regional partnership that manages the health of the Bay. Under this agreement, we have four main focal areas that will support management and planning throughout the Chesapeake watershed. Today, we will be presenting on the general scope of each objective, as well as an update on where they are at the end of the first year of the agreement. In collaboration with each of our partners, we will be working towards creating data and platforms that cover land cover and land use at a one meter resolution, high-resolution LIDAR-derived hydrology, best management practice opportunity mapping, as well as tracking and reporting of these implementation, and geospatial support for all partners. Each objective will take about 10 to 15 minutes to present. Please remember to send questions through the chat along the way, and now I'll turn it over to Rachel Subitsky, the team lead for Objective 1. All right, thank you, Katie. So again, my name is Rachel Subitsky, and I am the project manager of Objective One, which is the land cover and land use project. So we partnered with the University of Vermont Spatial Analysis Laboratory on this objective. And the main goal is to create the high-resolution one-meter land cover and land use maps for the entire Chesapeake Bay watershed for 2017, and then again for 2021. Many of you have probably heard of or have used before the National Land Cover Database, or the NLCD. This is a nationwide 30 meter resolution database. It's based off of satellite imagery. Uh, and this resolution of land cover is useful for a wide range of broader scale analyses. And here is NLCD over a densely impervious location, Washington, DC. The data we produce to support precision conservation is one meter resolution data set. Here's that same location in Washington, DC, but with our one meter land cover data. Now you can really see the smaller details, such as individual trees or paths. This is incredibly helpful for the parcel scale planning for restoration and conservation practices, among other analyses. So our previous Baywide data sets were for 2013 land cover and land use. These data sets spanned over 100,000 square miles, as they covered not only the counties that are within the Chesapeake Bay watershed, but also those intersecting counties as well. Um, and you can see here that the different classes for both land cover and land use, and I will actually go over that a little bit more later. These two data sets are currently available for download at our website, and the link will be shared at the end of this webinar. So zoomed in on an area within the watershed, here is the National Land Cover data set again at 30 meter resolution. 
you can sort of decipher that there is a stream uh, running across that area. And then here is that one meter 2013 land cover that we created over that same area. And you can now identify where trees are not located along streams for potential restoration projects. So that was just an introduction to our previous data sets and they all relate to CBP's current um, objective one that we're discussing today. And as Katie mentioned earlier, this is a six year agreement and we are just at the end of year one. So, so far within year one for objective one, We've completed that land cover change detection within significant areas of change, or what we've been calling hot spots of change. Uh, to identify these areas, we have been using USGS's land cover monitoring, assessment, and projection, or LCMAP data. LCMAP uses a 30 meter Landsat pixels to identify areas that have changed within a given time frame, so from 2013 to 2017, in this instance. Uh, we filter what we consider to be noise, such as false change that might have shown up from shadows or a roof just changing color. That's not really true change. Within the filtered LC map, we were able to get what we've considered to be the hot spots of change throughout the watershed, and those are shown in those pink, uh, those pink polygons on the right. That's overlaying on our land cover. Then within those areas, we've updated the land cover to 2017. The end product will be a 2013 wall-to-wall -wall land cover data set, but with the hot spots updated to land cover for 2017. Um, along with the boundaries of where those changes were updated so you're able to identify those. This product will be used to inform adaptive management approaches to achieve the pollution uh, reduction targets, but also helping to verify the effects of land policy best management practices. In addition to this hotspot change detection, once we complete the full 2017 and eventually the 2021 land cover data sets, we will be performing a finer scale change detection. And this will identify those small changes in the landscape, such as this individual tree planting or removal, or even a new house being built that might have been missed with those coarser hotspot analyses. As part of objective one, we are creating that new wall-to-wall -wall land cover and land use data sets for 2017 and 2021, as I've mentioned. So just a little bit about how we create the land cover classification. Uh, we use a few different data layers uh, to perform this classification. So first, and you can see in the top left, uh, we use a normalized digital surface model or an NDSM where it is available. This is created using light detection and ranging or what we call LIDAR data. For those of you who are uh, not sure, LIDAR data is collected by a plane that sends laser pulses to the ground and samples the surface of the earth. And that is used to produce a high resolution 3D representation of the land in the watershed. So we use LIDAR to produce two types of elevation maps known as digital elevation models, or a DEM, and also a digital surface model, or a DSM. The so DEM provides a ground elevation, while a DSM provides elevation of the tallest object over the ground. So that includes tree canopy or building rooftop. So we use those two data sets, the DEM and the DSM, to create this NDSM, which makes it easier to tell a difference between buildings in a parking lot, for example, that may have similar spectral signatures, but have different heights, so that helps with classification. Next, as you can see that middle image, we use leaf off aerial imagery where it is available. This helps with our tree canopy over impervious classes and our wetlands classes. And then the last image, the bottom uh, of the three, is the USDA's one meter national agriculture imagery program or NAEP aerial imagery. This is available over the entire continental United States for cycling years and it's acquired during agricultural growing seasons, so therefore it is leaf on. In addition to those data sets, we will incorporate county planimetric data where it's acquired and fitting. Um, once we use those data sets to perform this initial classification, we will perform a quality assurance, quality control in-house. In addition, we will be sharing this with local entities for their input before we finalize the data. And then for the land use, we modify the land cover using multiple ancillary data sets that include inf different information, um, including zoning, parcel boundaries, landfills, and existing land use data that a county may have provided us. This differs from the land cover as it shows more about how the land is being used as opposed to just what an object is on the ground. For example, the classes for land use, as you can see on the right there, uh, they differ in the sense that they separate um, differentiation between wetlands or a forest class separate from tree canopy and also has some more agricultural classes. 
Um, for 2017 and 2021 land cover and land use, we plan to use the same classes as our 2013 data set, just to keep it consistent and easy to use together. Um, the 2013 data set differs in classes slightly for Virginia, and we are working on a plan to make sure we address that. The 2017 and 2021 land cover and land use data sets will also be made available for download for free on our website, and we'll definitely be keeping everyone updated on when they will become available. In addition to those main classes of land cover and land use data sets I just showed previously, we've also been researching the feasibility of mapping some secondary classes. These include silviculture, greenhouses, animal operations, and also getting a higher accuracy for tidal versus non-tidal and forested wetlands. These classes will either be incorporated into our land cover or land use data or hosted separately um, that will also be available for people to download. And we will also keep you informed on when uh, we have made that decision on which classes we will definitely be mapping. As I'm sure most of you know, um, part of my job as project manager has been to perform local outreach to acquire the planimetric data. I have been requesting a variety of data sets, including parcel data, building footprints, and zoning. Um, these are very important to help with the accuracy of our land cover and land use data. So as you can see in this example in the middle of the screen, the land cover image on the top of the page, you can see buildings colored both in purple and in red. So the purple buildings are representing the most up-to-date county buildings data set that we acquired. These are helpful to give those clean, uniform shapes to buildings. Um, however, a new development has gone in since the county was able to update the buildings data set, and those are shown in red. The aerial imagery classification was able to pick those up. And therefore, it is important to use this dual approach with both sources to try and get the most accurate data. Um, and I also wanted to share my outreach results in the map on the right, since I'm really excited about all the participation that I've been receiving from counties and municipalities. This map is showing the green as those who have responded to my outreach, and yellow are those who I was unable to reach, maybe because I just couldn't find that proper contact. Um, if there are hash marks over the county, that means I was able to acquire updated planimetric data sets for those localities. And I just want to take a moment again and just reiterate that we are still accepting data sets as we'd really like to incorporate the local data into our products. So please feel free to send over data or if you have maybe a connection with the neighboring county who maybe have not reached, been able to reach yet, please like introduce us. That would be really helpful. Um, again, thank you for such a great response and enthusiasm for these data sets. It's been really exciting to hear and talk to you all. Um, so if you have any questions about Objective One, I will be able to answer those at the end of the webinar. You can just send those. Uh, via chat or just email me in another time. So now I'm going to turn it over to the project leader of Objective 2, David Saavedra. Thank you, Rachel. Yes. Uh, David here. I'm leading the second objective, which is high resolution hydrography and ditch mapping. Um, for this objective, we're partnering with Dr. Matthew Baker at UMBC. And the goal of this objective is to create high resolution maps, stream channels, roadside ditches, agricultural ditches from LIDAR elevation data across Chesapeake Bay watershed. This objective is an extension of a previous grant we received from the Chesapeake Bay Trust. That was a two-year project to review um, existing methods for mapping streams based on elevation data, uh, develop our own method, compare them, validate them in the field, um, and produce this method that I'm going to present to you today. So previously available data, uh, much like the NLCD that Rachel described, there's the NHD, which is the National Hydrography Data Set, which you can see here in red. This is a national uh, data set covering the entire United States. It's fully networked and very applicable for many applications. Um, but when you zoom in this close to a specific property, you can see it misses the stream on the left there. And while it incorporates the stream across the center of the screen, you can see that it doesn't map it particularly accurately, which can be a problem when you're trying to implement precision conservation practices. In blue here, you can see the stream maps that we've produced through this objective. Um, it provides a much more detailed and accurate representation of the streams. It's a one meter resolution raster, so it meshes nicely with the land cover. And it can be used to identify restoration opportunity areas um, which Lewis will cover here in a minute. <clears throat> to make this stream map, we use a multi-scalar approach. So previous approaches to hydrography based on elevation 
operate on a fixed scale, usually a three by three cell moving window. So these would include D8 flow directions or curvature. Um, and by using this small window, you lose the context of the surrounding terrain. We apply an algorithm that uses computer vision and a self-adapting window to classify the terrain multiple scales simultaneously. We've got an example of this on the right. You can see a LiDAR hill shade. And just visually interpreting this image, you can see where the ridges are and where the valleys are and where the hill slopes are. So this algorithm actually classifies that and quantifies it much the way land cover quantifies what's on the ground. So now you can see through the algorithm that the pixels in red are ridges, the pixels in yellow are slopes, and those in blue are valleys. So by classifying the landscape in this way, we can actually pull out the stream valleys and then use those as context for stream channels. So in this image here, you see that course classification of the landscape with the valleys in blue. We're able to extract those stream valleys and create a networked uh, valley network. And then we use that valley network to classify the landscape again at a finer scale and identify the stream channels within the valleys that make up the actual stream network. One of the issues with um, elevation-based hydrography is that high values in a DEM, such as roads and bridges that cross streams, actually work as dams when you try to route the flow across them. They block the flow. So previous approaches would require filling these depressions or cutting channels through the roads, which is very labor-intensive and computationally intensive process. Um, we use least cost paths to overcome these digital dams and actually connect these channel skeletons, as we call them, across the obstructions. So this purple polyline you see here crosses roads in the areas I pointed out. And the polyline allows us to attribute the network with different characteristics of the stream, such as bankful width, depth, uh, sinuosity, among others. Another part of this objective is to map ditches. Uh, so we use a very similar method, but instead of using stream valleys uh, as a constraint on our analysis, we can use roadside areas and agricultural fields and apply the same method to extract ditches in these areas, which you can see here in red. So as part of the first year's progress, we're working on a pilot in the lower Susquehanna Huck 8, which you can see on the right. It's comprised of 73 Huck 12s and covers the, the majority of York and Lancaster counties in Pennsylvania and a little bit more. So we've completed um, an automated stream mapping for this whole area and we're currently doing manual corrections as an initial round and then we're going to pass this off to stakeholders and an advisory committee and incorporate their input for a second round of manual corrections. And we expect to have this completed in October 2019 um, and it should be available sometime shortly after then. And with that, um, again, like Rachel mentioned, we're taking questions at the end, so please feel free to leave them in the chat box. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Lewis Cadell with Objective 3. All right. Thanks, David. Um, as a part of the Chesapeake Bay Program Objective 3 Partnership Project, the Chesapeake Conservancy will be creating a BMP or Best Management Practice Opportunity Data Blueprint for the entire Chesapeake Bay watershed. And we are partnered with Chesapeake Commons and Drexel University's Academy of Natural Sciences, and they will be working on updating a streamlined platform for project identification, prioritization, tracking, and standardized reporting. So the Chesapeake Conservancy um, done a lot of previous work looking at riparian opportunity areas along streams. I'll just go over real quick how we did this methodology. Using the high resolution land cover data set from objective one and stream channel networks from objective two, we can start to get at where riparian opportunity areas are along stream, as shown in purple here. And basically that is all areas where there are no tree canopy or shrubland land cover classes within a fixed distance from streams and water bodies. 
once we have this information, we can start to model where water is flowing to these riparian opportunity areas. And then after that, we can delineate the drainage areas um, flowing to these purple riparian opportunities. Within these drainage areas, we can also look at the acreage of agricultural, turf, and impervious surfaces and start to look at uh, loading rates that would go towards the, uh, these opportunities. Now, what's so powerful about this approach is that if you were to look at both opportunity areas along the stream uh, to the north there, you can start to see how they have generally the same area, but vastly different areas of drainage draining to them. So if a practitioner were to go to this property and the farmer or landowner didn't want to take all that land out of production along the stream, or say there was only a limited amount of funding to plant trees along one side of the stream, the conversation could be steered towards going for those areas that have the biggest bang for the buck, which would be the southern portion of the stream in this case. So the Chesapeake Conservancy has looked into other BMPs that are used throughout the Chesapeake and sought to find a way to um, map additional geospatial outputs to help with planning purposes for jurisdictions and uh, practitioners. The USDA has developed an agricultural conservation planning framework toolbox that has a whole suite of BMPs um, that we found were applicable to the Chesapeake. This toolbox is very comprehensive and methodical in how it outputs these um, geospatial BMP outputs. So the Conservancy will be um, automating this toolbox to scale up for the entire Chesapeake Bay watershed and will also be integrating high resolution data sets from objective one and two. In addition to this, we'll also be integrating additional research and development into precision buffers as opposed to the traditional fixed width buffers in order to take into account different variables on the landscape for better uh, sediment and nutrient pollution runoff capture. So in terms of progress, we're hoping to have a BMP data blueprint for a pilot region in York and Lancaster counties, Pennsylvania, and all of the HUB 12s that intersect those two counties. We hope to have this output by October of this year. And we'll also be putting together a technical advisory group uh, made up of local practitioners and technical, technical experts who will inform the output from this BMP process. Um, as a part of this BMP mapping effort, we would like to ask local jurisdictions um, with help for ancillary GIS data sets that could help with BMP mapping, including stormwater infrastructure, culverts, and other BMP footprints that could help with mapping potential locations and for validating the BMP opportunity results that come out of this analysis. So while the Conservancy is working on the BMP blueprint, Chesapeake Commons and Drexel Academy of Natural Sciences will be working on updating and enhancing FieldDoc, a streamlined platform for watershed implementation planning and reporting. This platform will seek to standardize nutrient and sediment load reductions across all of the Chesapeake Bay jurisdictions. Currently, FieldDoc provides rough estimates for load reductions for individual practices that approximate Chesapeake Bay Program CAST model estimates. CAST, which stands for Chesapeake Assessment Scenario Tool, is the Chesapeake Bay Program's official watershed model used to run forecasting scenarios, provide nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment estimates for BMP implementation at generalized local and regional scales, and is used to assess jurisdictions' progress towards meeting Chesapeake Bay TMDL allocations. In light of this, it is important that consistency is maintained with the CAST model when jurisdictions work towards developing TMDL milestones and watershed implementation plans. Over the course of this project, Chesapeake Commons will be working with the Chesapeake Bay Program to integrate official CAST load calculations into FieldDoc. FieldDoc will also seek to streamline tracking and reporting for both funders and practitioners by providing a centralized platform that can be accessed by both end users seamlessly. In addition to these features, the Drexel Academy of Natural Sciences team will be working with Chesapeake Commons to integrate cutting-edge back-end data analytics for FieldDoc, 
including a rapid watershed delineation function for stormwater BMPs and improved functionality for calculating project practice area statistics from the one meter land use land cover data produced by objective one. Chesapeake Commons has also been working to update field doc with additional functionalities and tools to create a better user experience, including the ability for the user to create or upload your own restoration project footprints, the ability to manage metrics, targets, and geographies at the site-specific and project levels, and an additional functionality for creating custom data dashboards for tracking and reporting. To learn more about field doc, please visit, please visit the link below. We will also be sending out a sign-up list after this webinar for a follow-up informational session focused on learning more about FieldDoc and its new and upcoming functionalities in more detail. With that, I'll pass the presentation over to Jake Lazier, who is the lead for Objective 4. All right. Thank you, Lewis, and hello, everybody. I'm going to be taking us home for our last objective today, Objective 4, which is general geospatial support. Um, we're partnering mostly with this with the Chesapeake Bay Program, essentially providing geospatial planning and support to the Bay Program to allow them and their partners to integrate geospatial data into their existing and future management efforts. So looking at this objective, we wanted to take a perspective of what is being done currently to structure and create GIS data and use at a sort of bay-wide scale, um, who is creating data that is being utilized by partners throughout the bay at this large landscape scale, um, how are they using it, uh, how are they not using it, and if so, why are they not using it, really taking a look at the current state of affairs when it comes to Chesapeake watershed-wide GIS efforts. Um, and part of that question is the who. Really looking at the stakeholders and the players in the game at the moment, both individuals and groups that are creating and utilizing GIS data. One of our primary groups of stakeholders for this objective would be the goal implementation teams from the Chesapeake Bay Program, or the GITS. These are six different uh, sort of work groups within the Chesapeake Bay Program, made up of not just Chesapeake Bay Program staff, but also federal, county, local government, NGOs, and other invested partners that focus on topics such as sustainable fisheries, maintaining healthy watersheds, fostering stewardship in the Chesapeake, and a variety of other tasks. Um, these six are the main gifts, but they don't always silo. There is a definite amount of overlap and cross-membership between these groups. Um, but these are sort of our big six that we're starting with to get an idea of who is doing what, where, when it comes to GIS in the Bay. Um, so like I said, our individual gifts are sort of our first stab at a stakeholder analysis. However, we also want to recognize the efforts of the cross-git mapping group within the Chesapeake Bay program. This is a group of folks who are in the variety of different gifts, but focus almost exclusively on the mapping and GIS efforts that come out of those gifts, uh, really identifying the GIS needs of those groups, the desires, um, and the sort of barriers that each of them face when it comes to completing their work when it comes to geospatial analysis. However, we're also in contact with the scientific technical assessment and reporting team out of the Chesapeake Bay program. This is a group of staffers as well as other partners that focus on more scientific methodology and the reporting aspect of the work that the kids do, not as much outreach or engagement, but a little more hard science, um, and how these team members are utilizing GIS from a scientific perspective. And while all those groups up there are not just Bay Program staff, they are made up of federal, local, state, NGO, and other kinds of partners. We want to take an idea and a stab at the other users and creators of Bay-wide GIS data sets, maybe outside the Bay Program. How are folks like the National Park Service utilizing GIS within the Bay? What are their standards and practices? What are their barriers to use and reasons for not using? How are they interacting with this sort of concept? Um, and so that's kind of answering the who of Objective 4 when providing geospatial support. But we, all know, we also want to take a look at the what specifically. So this is a map of chemical contaminants uh, within the Chesapeake Bay produced by the Healthy Watershed Git in 2017. And we just picked this as an example of a sort of bay-wide GIS data set that one of our stakeholders would be using. Uh, this is a strong example of ways that people look at the bay as a whole when it comes to GIS 
and what that sort of data would be. However, this is not the only example. Some of the other more prevalent ones that we've identified already in the Bay include the Chesapeake Conservation Atlas uh, through the Chesapeake Conservation Partnership, looking at large landscape conservation and utilizing about 30 different GIS layers to prioritize that conservation. We've also taken a look at the environmental justice screen tool through the EPA, uh, looking at factors of environmental justice, demographics, and pollution throughout the nation, but also on a baywide scale on census tracts. Um, looking at the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Model Phase 6 Map Viewer, which in layman's terms is the go-to tool for the cross gip mapping team I referenced earlier. This is a sort of repository of all of their layers that the different kids are using and how they're utilizing them. And also the draft comprehensive water resources and restoration plan from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers looking at, at a six states in the watershed wide 30,000 foot scale, what are the sort of layers of information that a GIS user could be utilizing. And these are only four sort of prominent large examples, but we're finding more and more as we're taking the sort of analysis of the stakeholders and what is on the landscape currently. So we're doing this sort of audience analysis to not just take an account of the current structures for GIS data creation and use in a baywide scale, but how those structures and use can inform our process moving forward with the data that my colleagues talked about earlier in objectives one through three. How do we take the lessons learned from how people are currently using and creating GIS data within the Chesapeake Bay watershed and use that to influence the structure and the sort of synergization, synergization to use a buzzword, um, of the data we've created now and moving forward. We don't, we're not in the business of creating information data that is not usable or accessible to partners, to individuals. Um, as an example, our land cover data from the last time we did land cover for 2013 was is publicly available and we really want to make sure that any efforts that are created throughout this work can be integrated in future efforts to set a standard for more usable and popular data. And now I'm going to pass it back to my colleague Katie to take us over the timeline. All right, thank you all for the detailed explanations that you guys have provided for the objectives under our cooperative agreement. On the screen now, you can see an estimated timeline for the anticipated deliverables, all of which, as we mentioned, will be made widely and freely available to all partners and practitioners. We will be sending out yearly updates through additional webinars, as well as email blasts for very important news. Um, and we look forward to working with all of you to improve precision and conservation restoration projects through the, throughout the watershed. We look, <clears throat> thank you to everyone who has already sent over data to us. If anyone has additional data, we would be happy to talk and include your data in our work as we've mentioned throughout the presentation. So by utilizing land cover, land use, and hydrology data, as well as the BMP blueprint and platforms for standardized reporting, we're excited to support regional efforts and collaborate with partners and practitioners to promote a unified front towards meeting the 2025 goal for a healthy watershed. For any specific questions you might have about the project, um, we ask that you contact the team leads whose emails are provided on the screen now. Additionally, we've listed on our webpage um, where this work will be hosted. Um, we have a frequently asked questions section where we will be continuously updating uh, any major questions that we get from our partners and practitioners throughout the region. Um, and we're also going to be posting this webinar, both uh, the recording of it as well as the slides uh, made available to you. But for now, we'll start answering some of the questions that you might have sent us thus far. So Emily is going to be reading out uh, the questions from the chat box that she sees. Our first question from the chat is, when will the LIDAR data be available for watersheds in the state of Virginia? Is the October 2019 deadline just for the Susquehanna watershed? Um, so the LIDAR data itself, there's currently almost the entire state of Virginia is either covered with LIDAR or has upcoming LIDAR plans. Um, for the hydrography derived from that LIDAR, the October 2019 
delivery is just for the Lower Susquehanna pilot. Um, after that, we're going to move on to a yet to be determined second location um, based on input from stakeholders in our advisory committee on where this data might be useful uh, sooner. Yeah, and just in addition to that, um, since we are collecting that LiDAR data bay-wide as the new data is being released, we're creating different uh, derivative products, so like a DEM, which we've collected that already exists, and then those NDSMs and LiDAR intensity, um, those types of data sets we are also trying to host on our website somewhere so that people can also download those as well. So hopefully that would be useful for everybody. Uh, another question from the chat. For objective two, again, will this data be used just for partner information on BMP implementation, or can we expect some sort of change to the Bay model based on the information gleaned from this analysis? The Agricultural Work Group has just begun looking into possible differences in ditch drain systems versus natural drainage, and would be interested to know whether the snapping exercise could inform that effort as well. I think, like Jake said, we want this stuff to get used by as many people as possible, so the answer to that is both. <laughs> <laughs> and that's part of objective four, what Jake is doing is really looking at how we can look at mapping efforts across the bay and what can we start making sure to put the land use, land cover, and hydrology into. Um, and just adding one note, sir, my name is Susan Minnemeyer. I'm a program manager here with regards to the CAST model. Um, we are looking at identifying projects that could exceed the average nutrient reduction identified in the CAST model that averages uh, potential load reductions across the landsca landscape. So at this point, it's not intended that it would change the um, CAST model itself initially, but at least uh, in terms of prioritization, identify projects that could exceed the average of uh, what the model predicts. Great, thanks. Uh, another question regarding the stream mapping efforts. Um, will the stream mapping pilot project in the Lower Susquehanna be able to incorporate the impact of hydrology, impact on hydrology of underlying karst geology, for example, in Lancaster County? Um, which could potentially impact the stream predicted using a topographically based analysis. So, <laughs> karst features are definitely something that I've run into as I'm working through this pilot. Um, I think the, the gist of it is the method that we've developed is only able to map streams that have an actual topographic signature in the LIDAR. So I know a common thing that happens in karst topography is streams disappear underground and then they may or may not show up again downslope. Um, so if the stream disappears, then it's going to disappear in the map that we produce. Um, that being said, with the, uh, the least cost connectivity that I described, that will connect portions of the raster map um, regardless of whether or not the raster map has identified a stream channel there. So, um, yeah, so in the raster map, we will have those karst features would be incorporated. Uh, in the, the vector map, they would be connected. Oh, and I, sorry, Emily, I just thought of another thing. Um, so, none of that would incorporate any subsurface flows that might be influenced by the karst topography. Uh, we, we can only map what's on the surface. Cool. And then one more question regarding ditches. What is the definition of an agricultural ditch? That is a good question. Um, <clears throat> again, since we're still in the pilot stages, we're sort of feeling this out, and we hope that we can get some more clarification from the advisory committee and the stakeholders. Um, but for now, it's basically, you sort of know them when you see them. Um, they're very uniform in shape, uh, very geometrical, and they're within agricultural areas, which we can identify through the land use of Objective 1 and um, common land unit data 
and others. But uh, yeah, we don't yet have a concise, clear definition. And then another follow-up to, I believe, the Kirk conversation, um, Scott Haig asked, so will there be no thinks in the SDG raster, which I think is referring to the... Um, if you're asking about sinks as in like a pit filled DEM affecting flow directions, um, we are going to produce flow direction map that will be adjusted based on those polyline connections. Um, does, does that answer the question? I'm just asking if they're going to be, uh, if, if the flow direction is all going to flow to Chesapeake Bay or will there be local areas that flow into, say, a stormwater basin and then go nowhere? Okay, yeah, it'll, it'll all be connected in the flow directions. Thanks, Scott. That's actually Scott Haig, who's one of our partners from Drexel University. Oh, there we go. Are there any other questions? Maybe for folks on the phone who aren't in the chat? All right. Uh, if there are no others right now, again, feel free to email us. Um, our emails are up there. Uh, and then also you can refer to that website that has the FAQs. And we can add some of those questions that we got today on there. Um, and yeah, we'll be sending out a uh, just a summary of this with the webinar recording, so especially for those who maybe weren't able to attend today, and then uh, also with maybe a survey of just kind of getting your input on like how you think some of these data sets could be useful for you, um, and then maybe, and then also for that field doc. Oh, there's actually one more question, I think. One more question. What CVP group will be the first place to hear updates from the team? Um, work yeah, so I'm actually presenting, I do present at the land use work group maybe every other month, so I think that's really where I do the most updates, just for objective one, and sometimes objective two will do some updates. Um, outside of that, I guess, you know, some people have asked me personally if they, you know, they would like to be updated on when some of these data sets will be out, but other than those work groups that I've been, we've been randomly presenting at, I think just, you know, every, at the end of every year, we would like to do this webinar just to keep you all updated. And then also, if some of these data sets are completed and uploaded to download in between those two years, we will definitely send out like a mass invite or mass email to let you guys all know when these data sets are available so you can use them as soon as possible. Is that the last question then for now? Yep. All right. Thank you, everybody, so much for joining us today. And we look forward to working with you all in the future. And yeah, thank you again.